On February 4, 2014, at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, Bill Nye joined Ken Ham for a debate on whether creation was a viable model of origins. Now, if you haven't already seen the debate, I've provided the link in the description below, so go ahead and watch that. However, if you're a fan of alcohol, I have a suggestion for you. A drinking game. Okay. Every time that Bill Nye says joy, and every time Ken Ham says assumptions, right there, drinking game. It'll really help you get through the video, trust me. Uh, just drink responsibly. You might want to drink weak alcohol because they say those words a lot. Anyway, in this video I plan to cover the top 10 points I feel still need to be confronted, finalized, and reiterated from the debate. First off, Ken Ham clearly doesn't understand career specializations, okay? Only general titles. So, doctors are doctors, right? And scientists are scientists, right? So, you can ask a foot doctor to perform heart surgery, just like you can ask a microbiologist to know something about evolutionary biology. Hmm, interesting. Keeping that in mind, Remember that people can become knowledgeable about topics without having the formal education to back them up. You know, Bill Nye has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, but he knows a lot about a lot of different fields of science because he has dedicated himself to learning about that stuff. Okay? So, just remember that, Ken Ham. Second point, contradicting yourself is not a good way to win a debate. Okay, Cult of Dusty posted a nice video, 90 seconds, just showing how he how Ken Ham contradicted himself so much, but I'm going to go in a different direction and basically ask Ken Ham whether he actually thinks the Bible explains all the scientific evidence or whether all the scientific evidence explains the Bible. Because you can't have it both ways. Realize that that's a cyclical argument. You can't do that. And he seems to also conveniently forget how the Bible has constantly been used throughout history to provide evidence for science, even when the science of the time was wrong. Fascinating how he forgets that. Also, he likes to emphasize how millions of people don't necessarily make something right. Millions of people believing in something doesn't make it right. Whereas, he sits there and provides evidence for lots of different scientists saying, oh yeah, evolution is not plausible and thinks that that actually means something. Hmm, interesting. Third point, everyone assumes something, okay? I assume things, I admit it. Scientists assume things, they admit it. However, scientists assume things based on the fact that there is no evidence to the contrary, okay? So, for certain universal constants, natural laws, as Ken Ham likes to say, there is no evidence that they've changed over time. But, Ken Ham loves to assume that God actually directed people to write the Bible. And that God somehow made sure that those people in charge of the Bible uh, accurately and reliably compiled it, edited it, and translated it. It's quite a few assumptions, if you ask me. So, the point is, is that reliable assumptions are based on facts not hearsay and superstition. Point number four, Bible is absolutely useless for predicting or explaining science. I'm just gonna say it, it really is. And you wanna know why? Is because it was a book that was written almost 2,000 years ago and its contents are exactly representative of what you'd think those people would do or say. It really is. Anything beyond that is a result of modern interpretations. And that's because the Bible has been used as evidence to support a flat Earth, Earth at the center of the solar system, and a universe that never changes, all of which are complete bullshit. And we know this. However, the Bible's views have morphed into where, oh yeah, no, the Bible does say Earth is round. Actually, ellipsoid. The Bible does say the sun is at the center of the solar system. The Bible does say the universe is expanding and it's dynamic. 
Okay. Bible is whatever you say it is. You're right. Gotcha. Point five. Natural laws never change. Just to kind of reiterate what we've already covered, um, you know, we basically have quantum laws that have always existed. Okay? As far as macroscopic properties, well, they could have always existed too. But they may have come about at the time of the Big Bang. Not entirely sure about that. But the point is, is that ever since the Big Bang, neither quantum nor macroscopic properties have changed at all. There's no evidence for it. If you wish to find evidence, publish it. Publish it and prove everyone wrong. I would love to be proven wrong. Okay? Just do it. Don't sit there and whine and complain and, you know, theorize about shit that you have no clue about. Okay? Point number six. Observations confirm history. Okay? There are not two kinds of science. Love of God. There is not two kinds of science. That's the most ridiculous thing ever. There are only lines of reasoning where facts support or deny hypotheses. That's it. That's how science works. Facts, hypotheses. Facts, hypotheses. Those are the two things that result from science. Okay? From the scientific process, I should say. And we know the age of our sun. Okay? Not because we were there when it was born, but because we can observe other stars in the universe. They're very similar in size, in composition, and in color. And we know how much longer our star has to live. Same thing with DNA. DNA confirms the fossil record. Okay? We can see, as we look in the geologic strata, that there are more complex organisms appearing the closer you get to the surface. And we can look at the living relatives of those organisms and see, oh yeah, they seem to be related in exactly the same fashion as we see them appear in the fossil record. They create this tree. Okay, the tree of life. Abiogenesis is the same way. You know, life coming from non-life. We have evidence for that. We have replicated conditions and shown that certain self-assembling molecules can come about randomly. Can come about completely randomly in a primordial situation. Point number seven, turning genes on and off is evolution. It really is. And it's funny because Ken Ham goes out and interviews this microbiologist. And he's like, hey, did this study about E. coli actually indicate that evolution was happening? And this guy's like, no. All that they were doing was showing that a gene was turned on. And it's like, hmm. You realize the processes involved in that, right? That basically... They studied these E. coli as they evolved over 40,000 generations worth, over 20 years, and showed that they turned on this gene in order to utilize citrate as a substrate. Okay? And in order to do that, these bacteria had to take this inactive gene for citrate fer fermentation and duplicate it, then activate it, and then duplicate it some more so they can utilize enough of the citrate to survive. Okay? And this is a process we call neo-functionalization. Okay? That's just one of the several genetic processes that are involved in the process of evolution. And the reason why microbiologists don't necessarily understand this very well is because they look at a very small scale of time and don't seem to think or know much about population genetics. Okay, and so they can't comprehend macroevolution very well because they're just used to looking under a microscope at a very tiny thing in a very tiny amount of time. And so if you take these processes over the 20 years and magnify them to a billion years, which is how long it took eukaryotes to develop, to evolve from prokaryotes, that's when you can really start to grasp how complex and how novel, how beautiful life is. It's because of all those novel things that can happen. You imagine every 20 years there's one novel trait 
over a billion years. That's a crazy amount of stuff that can happen. Can't even picture that in your mind. So go to people who have training in population genetics and ask them about macroevolution. They'll be able to tell you about it. Point number eight, consciousness is absolutely insignificant. Okay, it really is. It is not this magical property imparted upon humans by some supernatural creator. No, absolutely not. That is garbage beyond belief. It is a simple byproduct of intelligence. Okay? You have intelligent animals like dogs, cats, dolphins, monkeys. Those animals have some degree of consciousness. We as humans are not necessarily special in that regard. Okay? Point number nine. True scientists are flexible. Okay? Their beliefs go wherever the evidence lies. Okay? For instance, when I was growing up, I learned that rattlesnakes were the pinnacle of snake evolution. Okay? They have these long, folding front fangs, inject this chemical cocktail into prey. They have these heat sensors on the front of their mouth. And then they even have a rattle at the end of their tail that they can use to ward off predators. Okay? Absolutely magnificent animals. But it's interesting because we're starting to get away from that notion. In the past 10 years or so, research is showing that venom is not a special thing in snakes. And that most snakes are in fact venomous. Okay, Even this wonderful animal here actually produces some degree of venom. Most of it's in an inactive form and not in very large quantities. However, this animal is technically venomous. Okay, And so... What we're starting to see is that pythons are actually the pinnacle of snake evolution. Okay? These creatures have some of the highest mutation rates in the animal kingdom, as far as vertebrates are concerned. Okay? And so we're learning that when they evolved this constrictive method of acquiring prey, that is the magic right there. That they decide to get away from this chemical means of acquiring prey and choose a mechanical method that is able to squeeze the life out of something very quickly and very efficiently. This is a special animal. Okay. And funny enough, it actually does have heat receptors on the front of her face. Okay. Absolutely magical animals. And we know this because Komodo dragons have been found to be venomous. And we're seeing that snakes probably evolved from a venomous lizard. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Anyway, I digress. Basically what I'm saying is, is that scientific knowledge changes constantly. And that as those gaps in our understanding close, so does the role for religion to fill those gaps. Okay. That gap gets smaller every day. Okay. And so that brings me to my final point. One of Ken Ham's final points in his debate was that kids need to be taught the right way to be think, right way to think. Okay. Well, I have a different opinion on that. Okay. I myself am a teacher, therefore I feel like I have some experience in this field and can understand what you need to be teaching kids to get them to understand what the right way to think is. And first off. Teach kids to never stop asking questions. You know, whereas Ken Ham would sit here and provide the Bible in front of you and be like, oh yeah, just uh, digest everything out of that, but uh, don't dare question it. Yeah, never going to be said in my classroom. Okay. Second point for kids, don't believe something without evidence. Once again, something that Ken Ham wouldn't necessarily agree with. Third point, if you ever doubt something, hypothesis, theory, whatever, gather some evidence and disprove it. It's just that simple. And if you do these three things with our kids, we can very quickly produce a generation of citizen scientists. Okay. Note, these kids do not have to become scientists as a profession. They just have to be informed, intelligent members of the public. And that's it. 
And you know what? That will result in a better world for everyone. Okay? Not only people, but the environment and the animals within it. Absolutely everything can benefit from that kind of understanding and knowledge and comprehension. So, to summarize everything, don't let the Bible think for you. Please, think for yourself. You are better than that. All right? Thank you very much for watching. Please have a good weekend. Be safe. I'm out.